Hello in YouTube land. I'm David Singleton, producer of many of the contents of the new King Crimson on and off the road box set. And I've been persuaded that maybe I would like to explain to you how we produced much of what it contains. Um, so I shall, in a completely off the cuff manner, try to talk you through it. Um, actually, the simplest parts I'm, are the, the reissues. So within it, you have uh, all three albums, Discipline, Beat and Thrift for Perfect Pair. You have the 30th anniversary editions. You have the 40th anniversary remixes by Robert Fripp and Stephen Wilson and in both stereo and surround sound. So there is enough reason for anyone to want to buy a box set. Uh, thereafter, you also have virtually all the live shows of that band that we've ever released under GGM or ever worked on, starting with Absent Lovers uh, back in the 1990s. I think it contains the very first show the band played, the last show of every year of touring, and many of the ones in the middle. And all of that already existed before we started to assemble this box set. So I asked myself, why did we spend about three months of hell producing this box set? What was it that was so problematic? And uh, with the audio, the first thing was the notion that we would like to go and revisit the archives, uh, the unreleased bits of the archives. In the previous ones, in Lark's Tongues and Aspect, we did um, Keep that one, Nick. I'm losing the tracks. And on, in the Thrack box, we called it uh, Jurassic Thrack, I think. Basically, a fly on the wall look at the, the original studio sessions. And uh, the idea was that we would revisit it again uh, for this album. And we did, but not as much, partly because we'd been there already. So the, um, the Champagne Urbana sessions, which were made from the aborted 1983 recordings, had already been done in the club, so we'd already made a fan rather fantastic, hopefully, compilation from that. But we did go back and we did look. There are some cassettes of their original trials in the studio, and I have them here, if Alex can show you. So this is why it takes so long, because if I zoom out on this screen here, we all try and get the screen. So in hours, where are we? So an hour. That's one hour. This would be... Ooh, three hours. So, so, so from there to there, each of these is three hours long. So, and each of these is a recording or a stereo channel. So that one is three hours long. That one's about an hour long. That one's about three hours long and et cetera, et cetera. And you keep going down there are one, two, three. I'll go down them four, five, six, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. There are about 20 and more. There are about 20 channels. So therefore, I think we're already up to about 60 hours, 60 hours of wonderful things that some of you would love to listen to, but actually a lot of it's interminably boring. <laughs> it's lots and lots of versions of Trevor Perfect Pink Pair being played slightly differently in different ways. And Alex and I have sat there and listened to it all. Actually, Alex, God bless him, I think, did most of the listening the first time around. Um, and amongst that, we then did find the bits that were interesting. I was going to play a few here. So... A secret tickle here. This was actually from the recording of Dig Me. And if you can hear, we have. There are lots of rather wonderful sounds made by Adrian. There's some. A lot of it sounds very, very like Doctor Who. I don't know if they actually ended up on the final track of Dig Me, but they were definitely sound as if they should have belonged with Dig Me. And there is a collection of those hidden away on the box set. I won't tell you where. Some of you will find it, but there is a hidden track, not very well hidden, which has that on it. But further down, we did then go and we found a certain amount of them uh, rehearsing, which was interesting. The most interesting part was a version of uh, Lark Sons and Aspect Part 3 where they were experimenting with two or three sections that never got used. So this was more interesting because it's music you hadn't heard, none of us heard before. So we compiled a 15 minute fly on the wall documentary with the studio chat, chit chat in between um, which became called Are You Recording Gary? He says reading it from here. 
which is because at the beginning of one of the takes, you can hear uh, Robert say, are you recording Gary? So are you recording Gary was the first part of the unreleased archives that we did. And thereafter, we then raided um, Alex's rather wonderful Stormy uploads. He had been doing some Redux mixes on the 1980s material where you take the multi-tracks, but in, you take away some of the key parts so that you can hear the parts that no one had ever heard before. Um, and several people have been commenting online, we should make an album of these. So we did. And uh, we took his parts, edited them so that they became more coherent for a, more, for a wider audience and made three pieces which were also on the same CD called, oh, Discipline Redux, Beat Redux and Thriver Perfect Pair Redux. I might or might not be able to play you a tiny bit of that. Um, what have I got if I came down here? Let me just see if I... This is the assembly of it here. So you can, it's, these things take forever to assemble because you have to try and make them coherent and work. But Um, that, in fact, is part of Lark 3, but never made it to the final version. Um, and even at this stage, we were still relatively sane. We'd now, I think, completed all the CDs for this box set. And there we were thinking, what a wonderful 1980s box set. We're so happy until the footage arrived. And uh, what happened was that we received a large number of tapes from Japan. Uh, I, I would say they're unlabeled. They were labeled. They had... Um, some Japanese writing on them, <laughs> um, which we tried to have translated, but in proof it didn't seem to be very useful because we knew what they were. They were uh, original tapes from 1984, from the, um, the recordings that went out as the 1984 video. But what we discovered we had was um, original camera angles uh, from that. So we had um, a, a single camera angles from the first night, the second night, uh, we had the, the first night, an edited version that had never been released and um, a, a different version of what went out as the original Three of a Perfect Pair video. And sorting that out took, out for, for, took a long, long time because it, it wasn't very well labeled. We had to work it out. So we eventually edited the four versions. So now in the box set you have the original Three of a Perfect Pair, much, much sharper than it's ever been because this was the original camera angles, plus three unreleased bits of video. And we were still doing relatively well. We were thinking life is good. This video is going well. We moved on to Frejus. We, we found a new video of Frejus, much, much sharper. We did that one and the same with the Alabama Haller. Um, then came the whole question of widescreen. It gets worse and worse, you know, this box set. So there was a, there was a dilemma. This is old, this is low quality video in effect. Uh, so it's narrow screen, low quality video. What do you do with it when everyone wants to watch it on their nice widescreen TVs? And there are two schools of thought. One is you leave it narrow screen, which is purist and it looks very good, but you have the pillar boxes down the side. And certainly when my children look at it, they think, oh, that looks very old footage. That must have been from before cars were invented. Um, alternatively, you can turn it into widescreen. The problem is you actually, usually you have to, you lose quality because the only way you can create widescreen from a, um, a square picture is by making it bigger and chopping some of it off. So if this happened to be your video screen and you want it to be widescreen, the only thing you can do is this and that becomes, that becomes your screen. So in fact, you actually have to make the middle part bigger and you lose the top and the bottom. So you can create widescreen, but in fact, you are lowering the quality of the, the video in so doing. However, being TGM, we always think of a mad solution that hopefully will work better. So I have a snippet from Frejus. So if I can do this without anything crashing. So in Frejus, this here is the original footage. Let me just see if I can hide that from behind. Or hide logic there we go. Right, here floating in the middle of the screen, you have Adrian in Frejus. 
it's square and it is, it is and it looks fantastic and this is available on the box set as it was on the original so if I was to play it now So that's the footage. And sadly, I had the rather extreme idea looking at that footage of what would happen if instead of simply doing the footage by doing this to make it wider, I extended it sideways with a bit of footage that doesn't actually exist. Because if you look at most of this footage, it actually moves into black on the edge. Um, so this is this is black. So if I could actually find living real black footage, because you can't use just black because it isn't really black. If you can find re matching real black footage, you could widen the picture to a widescreen without the downsides of having to squ squash it and blow it up. And believe it or not, if I move seamlessly from A to B, look here, I shall kill all these things my screen's giving me. So Roughly the same shot. There is Adrian there. Here is Adrian. Now, with extra widescreen. And if it will play, it becomes this. So all of this footage over here is in fact new or this bit over here. And there you have it. That all seems very simple, but the simple act of putting a bit of black on that footage probably is a month's work because you actually have to do it on every frame they change. So the black is here, the black is here. And of course, it's never black. It's actually a precisely different cover color for every single frame. So a stupid idea probably, but hopefully some of you have enjoyed the phrase use widescreen. And it's things like that that make me say that I will never, ever, ever be doing another box set. But I have said that every year for the last five years and we do seem to keep producing box sets. So who knows?